you come up with this idea of hiking Yangtze River? So all in all, it was probably in 2015 when I came up with the idea. <clears throat> Actually, when I was in training and preparation for my second world record, which was a traverse of Madagascar's length. So whilst I was walking Madagascar, I was always thinking about the next expedition, the next trip. That's what helps me keep me focused. Um, and then when I returned in 2016 from Madagascar, I put heavy plans and preparation into planning the Yangtze expedition. I actually came to China in 2010 um, and I was only here for about two weeks. I went to Beijing, uh, Shanghai, Hong Kong, Macau for the world's highest bungee jump. Um, and then I left for Southeast Asia. But it was at that point, 2010, when I was 19 years of age, that I knew I would be back here in China to take on something through the heart of the country. I just knew it was so much bigger than I first anticipated. So diverse, you know, so beautiful as well that I wanted to really go through the heart of the country. And how long have you prepared for this hiking and what have you prepared? So it was a two year in the making preparation scheme that I had going on. So it took two years to plan all in all. Um, and I originally, I started to look at what I could do in China. I was looking at the Great Wall of China. I was looking at various different terrains like the desert or the, the forest or the mountains. And then I came up with the idea uh, once, I had, once I'd done more research that the Yangtze is the third longest river in the world after the Nile and the Amazon. But all three of these are very close in terms of length. Uh, the Nile has been walked, almost been walked. Uh, the Amazon was walked in 2008 uh, and there was no evidence to suggest that the Yangtze River had been walked. So of the two longest rivers in the world and the third longest river in the world still remaining, I focused my concentration on attempting to become the first person to walk the Yangtze after, of course, doing extensive research in China to see if it was a first and, and globally. Um, so it was a lot of heavy planning, a lot of finding the right teams, a lot of permissions, uh, visas, permits, etc. Um, and a lot of planning to see what the dangers were and the challenges and how I could overcome each challenge along the way. Did you take some lessons or for this hiking or you just learn everything by yourself? Yeah, a lot I've learned through experience. So I've been traveling now for almost 10 years. Uh, I've done various adventures around the world from cycles to surviving in the jungle uh, with tribes to trekking the mountains. Uh, and of course, trekking expeditions. Uh, my Mongolia trip was the first big world first expedition. That was a solo and unsupported walk across its length. Madagascar again was a, a 1,600 mile walk. That took me 155 days to walk from south to north. And so both of these trips, I gained a lot of experience from uh, and learned an awful lot um, to help me on this China exp exploration. Can you compare the last time you trekked in Mongolia yeah. and this time in, in China with the Yangtze River? Which, which one is more difficult? Um, I would say they are both difficult in their different ways. Uh, I almost lost my life in the Gobi Desert. I was pulling a trailer behind me that weighed 120 kilograms, 18 stone, carrying everything that I needed to survive. Uh, and five weeks of that was through the Gobi Desert. Uh, I was low on water and it got, got to a point that yeah, I did almost lose my life. I had to keep getting out from under the trailer uh, and push on just for 100 meters is all that I could walk uh, with the trailer before resting underneath away from the heat of the sun again. So the Gobi Desert was a close call. Um, however, with this expedition, this has offered different challenges, different dangers. You know, the source of the Yangtze is one of the highest sources of any major river, you know, over 5,100 meters altitude, which is almost the same elevation as Mount Everest base camp. Um, and so far along this journey, within the first half of Mission Yangtze, 10 people have joined me, but eight people have had to leave the expedition due to illness, fear, or altitude sickness. So I think that puts into perspective just how difficult this expedition has and can be. Um, I've faced minus 20 degrees Celsius, snow blizzards, uh, there's been bears, there's been wolves, there's been tributaries that we've had to cross. Um, and so, yeah, a lot of it has been very, very intense, very demanding. But again, 
just so diverse and beautiful throughout and I've had to just keep getting up each day and, and pushing on forward no matter what. Do you have some um, interesting stories that you have met of this young young river hiking and to share with us? Sure, there's been there's been a really there's been a lot. Um, so the first was actually getting to the source two days before we arrived at the source. My film crew got altitude sickness and they had to leave. Um, then as we found the source of the Yangtze River, the true and scientific source, which is south of Qinghai province, my guide then got altitude sickness as well. So that actually brought me off the, off the expedition for about a week as I had to try to find other people and make sure that those people that were ill were, but were back safely with their families. And then I went back with my horse called Castor Choi and two new guides. Um, and from then on, it got very interesting. We had wild yaks trying to get close, trying to attack our horse. We had to set off Chinese firecrackers. We had bears getting too close. And again, setting off the Chinese firecrackers. One morning seeing bear footprints and being warned by the locals that you're here at the most dangerous time. The bears are coming off the mountain peaks because it's getting too cold for them. They're looking for food before they go into hibernation. Um, and we were food in the bear's eyes, so we had to stay vigilant at all times. Um, we were detained by the police on many of occasions. Uh, they were worried for our safety. Uh, and they were like, they were confused as to what I was doing so high up in the mountains in just a tent with all the dangers. So there were many times that they pulled me in, they questioned me. But once they realized what I was doing and realized what I've done before and realized that this is my profession, this is what I do, uh, they actually exchanged WeChat and Weibo and started following the journey, you know, which was, which was really cool. Um, I've had to take many detours due to the landslides as well, of course, you know, the, the heavy rain, the heavy storms causing landslides into the Yangtze, causing floods, flooding cities and towns, people having to evacuate. And I've had to take big detours back into the, into the mountains. Uh, but wow, the stories could go on, there are many to even being attacked by Tibetan Mastiff dogs, which are the guard dogs in the Tibetan plateau that look after the Gur. Um, very scary, and I've had to really fight them off before now. Mm -hmm. I heard that you got a horse with you. That's right. And how about the horse? Can, we, can you tell us something about this horse? Why yeah. did you buy a horse? So the film crew that originally joined us, they, their gear was, was too much. It was, it was too heavy. They couldn't carry it, so they needed a horse. And so we had a horse sent to us before we went in search of the, the start, the source of the Yangtze River. As the, as the horse arrived, my two members of the film crew got altitude sickness. So they had to leave, but they left us in the mountains, in the wild, with a horse that we didn't need. But there was nothing we could do with this horse, so we decided to use the horse. So we took the rucksacks off our back, strapped it to the horse. It was nice and light for the horse now. Uh, compared to the film crew that, that it was going to be carrying. Uh, and we were with the horse, which I named Castor Choi. Mm. Castor Choi. Yeah, for, for about three, three and a half weeks. Okay. Me, my two guides, and my horse Castor Choi. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> Through the mountains. It was great, great experience. Okay. And what is your plan for the coming journey? So now that I've reached, I'm over halfway. Mm -hmm. Pansihua was my halfway point. I've now probably got around, around 1,300 miles left of the journey, or 1,500 miles. Uh, I now walk directly east. I will face different challenges. In the west, it was very wild, very remote, very isolated. A lot of dangers in terms of wildlife, but a lot of the locals were amazing, really friendly and really hospitable. In the east, I'll face different challenges. And the challenges may be that the, the, the warmer season is coming. There, there could be the rainy season, which will flood the Yangtze River. Floodings is always an issue. Uh, there's a higher population, so I'll be coming across more people now, which means it's good for food. I'll never run low on food. Um, but there could be more traffic now. There's going to be more roads following alongside the Yangtze River. Um, so the traffic could be something serious as well, which is crazy to think, really. But the V-shaped valleys, I still face, of course, the Three Gorges Dam yeah. and the cliffs around there that I need to learn how to navigate. Um, but I take it a day at a time. I break it down into lots of little sections and lots of little chapters. Mm -hmm. 
uh, and see how we progress. But we walk directly east now for the next four to five months to Shanghai. Maybe the next journey is much easier than... I think so. Yeah, I think that this next section should be easier. There shouldn't be as many dangers. Um, but there could, be, there, there could be different challenges. There could be a lot of paddy fields, crop fields that I don't have permission to go through. You know, there could be a lot of secure, sensitive areas that I've got to plan in advance and try to avoid. Um, because when comes with a bigger population, brings further, further troubles sometimes, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, I need to take that into account. Okay. And how long will you stay in Chongqing? In Chongqing, I am here for another week and a half. I've been here for about six days so far. So I've got another week and a half before I go back to Ibin and carry on walking from Ibin through Chongqing and to Shanghai. What is the plan during when you're in Chongqing? Chongqing, it's about experience the, experiencing the local culture, um, getting, getting familiar with the traditions here, doing a lot of filming. You know, it's a big city, many different city centers. So we want to we want to go at the top of skyscrapers to get a beautiful view of the the night sky. Uh, we want to take a river cruise where we can see the rural side of the Yangtze River mixed with the urban side. Um, the hot pot, I've tried the the hot pot. Um, I really like it, really good. And uh, many many other. I'm doing a lot of interviews, of course, a lot of meetings. So it's great. It's been a good time here in Chongqing. And Chongqing was like a p the pinnacle. When I was planning the Yangtze a few years ago, Chongqing was one of those places that I couldn't wait to get to because I knew that once I reach Chongqing, it's a huge milestone in which I walk directly east then to Shanghai. Still a big journey, of yeah. course, but it's not zigzagging as such all over the place. So uh, it's a good place to be. And what impressed you the most of Chongqing? I think it was probably when I arrived at night time and I saw just how big, how big it was and vast and the city lights at night time were beautiful. Uh, and I walked to where the two rivers meet. I walked down to the viewpoint and that was just stunning to see all of the lights. Uh, yeah. Especially when you've been in the wild for a long time, when you come to the city and you see all of the lights, it's wow, two different worlds. Is it possible that you were playing some challenge of extremely difficulty in Chongqing? because we have some places that are very dangerous or some places that are very wild in Chongqing. Yes, well, I've actually uh, joined up with Kailas. Mm -hmm. um, Kailas, who is an outdoor brand, an outdoor company here in China. Um, and we're actually leading a two-day trek and not far from here around the mountains in a national park. Uh, so we're currently planning for that and we'll be giving people the chance and the opportunity to come and to come along and join me for two days trekking and one night camping in Chongqing. In Chongqing, yeah. Where is that? That's uh, that's northwest from here. I forgot the name of the national park. We're in the planning stages now, uh, but it's a beautiful area around when? the mountains there. When? That will be on the first, uh, on the second and third of March next month. Next month. Yes. So next month you are back to Chongqing. I'm still here. We're on the 26th now. So okay. it's only next week, is it? Next week, week after? Oh, next week after. Yeah. Go there. And That's right. We can, anyone can, can be there with you? People have to enroll. So there's only around six spaces available. Six spaces? Six spaces available. But there is a poster. It's on my Weibo and my WeChat accounts. Um, you can also share the poster if you wish to see if you can get people uh, involved in enrolling. And if this one's a big success, which I'm sure it is, because we've had many applicants already apply, it's now down to the choosing game, uh, then we will be doing more in the future where people can actually join me along the way of Mission Yangtze. Wow, that's a very good opportunity. Yeah, yeah. We want this to be one of the world's most interactive expeditions. So we don't want it to be just about me doing the trip. We want people to get involved. I've partnered up with lots of different organizations and conservations, like the Green Biodiversity, organization and the the fdy fishery protection and water to go and we're promoting how beautiful china is the diversity the culture the traditions uh, as we go through on this on this yangtze river expedition you were born in 1990 that's right yeah wow so i'm 28 now just yes <laughs> very young and in china we were born in 1990 you just get a work to do at this time 
Got you. Yeah, but you have accomplished three great challenges. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. What 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 is uh, what support you to conquer this challenge? Um, I would I would you mean like my fascination? Yeah. Uh, I w- I've always been very sporty uh, when I was in school. I was always competitive, very sporty. Uh, but I come from a normal background. I don't come from a money background. Uh, I had the idea of going travelling, and I had to put a plan in place. Uh, I, my first job, I was only earning, I think, about 30 yen per hour, 30 yen, um, and I had to get different jobs. Uh, I was a lifeguard. I was able now to save more money as a lifeguard. I had the fascination with exploring the world and experiencing things firsthand as I travel, making mistakes and learning from the mistakes. Um, and I, I did. I, I was fascinated. I was excited. I was obsessed with this idea. I was doing an outdoor education qualification in, in college, and I, I worked to gain my scuba diving qualifications so that I could work abroad whilst I'm travelling to top up the to top up the money as I go. And I guess it was my first step into China and then Southeast Asia at age 19 that my fascination for not only travel but adventure started to grow. I cycled across Vietnam and, and Cambodia on $10 bicycles, no pumps, no puncture repair kit, very low budget, very bog standard, and that was around 2,000 kilometers. Uh, we then learned how to survive in the jungle with the Burmese Hill Tribe. Uh, I was then working as a scuba diver in Thailand, but also a Muay Thai fighter, which is Thai kickboxing. Um, and, and then after all of these different challenges, I really wanted to take on my biggest yet, which was the Mongolia trip. And it was the Mongolia trip that was the catalyst in this direction, in this career. And that's what brought on Madagascar and China. Do your parents support your challenge? Financially, you mean? Uh, not only financially, but uh, they, they like you to... to got you, got you. Uh, there's no financial support. I've got to work myself and they've always been a big believer of if you want something, you've got to work hard to achieve it. Um, and where they have really supported is they've backed me mentally, you know, they've encouraged me. Uh, they have their worries, of course, uh, but they believe that, you, you know, you only live once. You must enjoy the life that you live. Um, and whatever your passion and dream and vision is, don't ignore it. Go after it go after it uh, with, with all your heart, follow your heart effectively. Um, and they've always been very motivational, very positive, very supportive in that way. Uh, and sometimes I come up with crazy ideas. But to them, they don't see it as such as crazy. Um, a lot of people see what I do and they, they sometimes think it's reckless, but they don't know what goes on in the background. There's a lot of hard work, there's a lot of planning, there's a lot of focus in the logistics. There's a lot of looking at the dangers and understanding how, how do I overcome that danger? How do I overcome the challenge? Um, there's a lot of physical preparation in terms of exercise and a lot of mental preparation and finding the right teams on the ground. And so I think with my parents seeing me going all out for the training, for the preparation, for the planning, they, that makes them feel confident that I'm not just doing it reckless anymore. And yeah, I just want to do that. Let's go for it. It's very much studied, researched, um, and, and planned really well. You do all this by yourself? I, the team has started to grow now. So originally it was all by myself, yeah. But now I've got different, different supporters, different team members, uh, representative agents. Of course, I've got um, TV, uh, books as well. So different agents helping with different things. But my dad actually works extremely close with me now. Uh, he's a part of the business. He acts like a representative, so we both work very close together, speak every day. He discusses business in the UK, I discuss it in China. So um, the adventure is what I love, but I also love the business side of it as well, and so does he. And that's why we're both super enthusiastic with each other and, uh, and try hard to keep climbing that ladder. When you take this journey of Yangtze River, yeah. uh, did you out of food? Did I? Out of food. Did I run out of food? Yes. I, I did, yeah, I so did. Where did you get that food? I got the food, um, it's ration pack food it is. So I carried ration packs oh. where you pour hot water into it. It's like de- uh, dehydrated ration pack food. Um, and my two guides didn't bring enough food for themselves. So I had to give them my food and we all went through the food pretty fast. 
uh, for the remainder, we luckily came across locals along the way, living in their gurs or their, their felt tents. Um, and as I mentioned, just amazing, so friendly. They would always invite us in. They would always provide us with shelter, allow us to stay the night and give us food that day and for the following days ahead. What is your plan for the future after the, the, the hiking of Yang River? Yeah, good question. I would like to further develop myself here in China. I would like to do more expeditions. You know, China's this, again, as I say, it's huge, it's beautiful, it's so diverse. And you've, you've got, I always say that you've got almost every country in one country here. You know, you've got the different dialects, the different culture, traditions, different weather systems, environments, and terrains from the jungles, the mountains, the, the deserts and whatnot. Uh, so I think there's an awful lot to do here. There's a lot of China that is so unexplored as well. Yeah. Uh, when people in the West think of China, they think of the big cities. <clears throat> you know, they think of your Chongqing, Shanghai, Beijing. But what they don't think about is just how much wildlife, how much nature is also here in China. And so I like to promote that side of China as well. You know, the big time cities, but the beautiful wilderness. Uh, and in the future, I would like to learn Chinese for one. I'm trying to practice now, but it's really difficult whilst I'm on the expedition. I need to stay in one place and study and take lessons. Uh, I only had three weeks lessons in Dali, Yunnan province. Um, but I would like to learn the language more. I know that would take a few years and I'd like to build the brand more here, work closer with TV companies um, and further develop here in the, in the China market for sure. I think there's a lot of opportunity here and it's an exciting place to be.